W P H A T. You're listening to the number one health and wellness podcast, the place where health and consciousness connect. Perfectly, Perfectly healthy, healthy and tone, tone radio, radio, radio with your host, Darren McDuffie. And now, prepare to get fat. What's cracking, peeps, and welcome to another episode of Perfectly Healthy and Toned Radio. I'm your show host, Darren McDuffie, and today I have a classic episode for you. I'm already calling this a classic. Did with uh, Shannon Garrett, and it is treating Hashimoto's holistically. But before getting into that episode, wanted to give you a reminder of last week's episode I did with Dr. Kara Driska on fatigue. If you are suffering from fatigue, you need to get that checked out. Fatigue is the first symptom that something is going awry. And Dr. Carrie Drisga and I discuss many of the root causes behind fatigue. Great, great show that you can go and listen to. You did not catch that show. You can always subscribe to me on Blog Talk Radio or subscribe to me on iTunes. Just go to iTunes and look for Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio and there I will be. And then you can subscribe and again, get all the shows and download them into your iPod. I love giving you this information. Do with the information as you will. Now, getting into today's episode with Shannon Garrett. Don't have much of a bio for Shannon, but I do know that Shannon is a thyroid recovery specialist and also she's a functional nurse nutritionist. Says a lot for someone who has been in the medical field for a while and decided to really blend nutrition into what she's doing. So Shannon has her own particular story. She's a Hashimoto's patient herself and she actually visits at nine doctors before getting a diagnosis and actually getting some help. So she's had her own journey and now what she's doing is helping others through that journey of discovering if they have Hashimoto's and providing some of the healing. Interesting show about her own healing and the things that she had to do, not so much as physically, but things that she had to do emotionally in order to be able to allow herself to heal. So I'm sure that you will enjoy the show. And if you like what Shannon has to say, and if you want to work with Shannon, you can visit her at shannongarrettwellness.com. Enjoy the show. Shannon Garrett, welcome to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. How are you? I'm doing great, Darren. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Really great to have you on. I know that we tried to schedule a show before and something happened and we're finally here. And I'm so glad that we are finally getting the chance to talk about Hashimoto's thyroiditis because I know that there's a lot of women. There might be some men out there as well who are suffering from thyroid conditions. But I know that you've had your own journey with this particular um diagnosis that you got what eight nine years ago or you had that eight or nine year journey so i wanted to really start the interview out by talking about your journey and really your background and how you came how you came to be okay great well thank you for having me again i'm sorry for the you know inability to get connected before but we're here now and i'm i'm very excited so if you can believe it or not darren my journey began before facebook even existed if anyone can even remember a time that facebook (laughs) did not exist and it was a very isolating and scary time for me because you know i'm living in in a world in my home with all of these symptoms that i'll get to in a moment but um there were no online forums there was no one to reach out to no other women to collaborate with you know like there is now so there is improvement there i do still see though that women aren't getting diagnosed as quickly as they should in my particular journey i was misdiagnosed for eight years by nine different doctors one of whom was a world renowned endocrinologist and you know the medical wisdom i received was um you know your symptoms are part of being a woman your symptoms are a part of getting older. (laughs) Uh You just probably need to eat less and exercise more and you'll feel better or take an antidepressant. So even though I was um, told that I had hypothyroidism and prescribed Synthroid, you know, as they raised the dose of Synthroid, the sicker I became. And it was... (laughs) such a scary time for me so I had relentless fatigue I mean this Darren was bone crushing fatigue not the type of fatigue that you know 
resting for a few hours or a nap or anything like that really even helped. It was just relentless fatigue and bone crushing. That's all I, in the best way to explain it. Um, one symptom I really had that was of concern was this mystery pain in my calves. So I would try to take a simple walk with my husband or something or just, you know, working around the house. And as soon as I would start to walk or move, you know, get blood flow going, I would have this calf pain that the way I describe it, it was like if I took one more step, it felt like a rubber band that went rigid that was about to break. As a nurse, I knew that that was a sign of um, a condition called claudication, which is a vascular disorder normally seen in people with, you know, peripheral artery disease and so forth. And it's related to blood flow through the lower extremities and pain results because the vascular system can't handle the blood flow. I got tested for that when I would communicate those symptoms to doctors. I was tested at least four times for claudication, and it was always a negative test. Um, weight gain. You know, I could just wait, gain weight by looking at food. <laughs> uh, inability to sleep, severe constipation, one of the most troubling uh, symptoms I had or or not a symptom, but just the reality of not being diagnosed correctly was uh, infertility. So I had a, you know, near a decade of my life there that really struggling with stress, anxiety, depression. I remember when I was in what I know now was the hyper phase um, of the autoimmune thyroid process I had severe stress and anxiety, panic attacks. It went into agoraphobia, and I couldn't even leave my house because I was afraid that I would get out, you know, like in the grocery or the mall or wherever, and something would happen. I would have a panic attack, and, you know, when I felt that coming on, I always got back home as soon as I could to be in my safe place, but eventually the panic attacks followed me around in my home. <laughs> um it was really, you know, in those days, you didn't hear much about holistic practitioners, but I came across this holistic nutritionist, and since then, I've also become a nutritionist <laughs> just because of my journey, but she connected me with this doctor who she didn't even know, you know, if he was accepting patients or not. She was sort of practicing underground, and... um you know, I met with this doctor, he held my hands, he actually prayed with me, and he said, you know, if you'll just give me six weeks, I promise we'll get to the bottom of what's going on. And uh, he made good on his promise, so within the six weeks, after all the testing, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, celiac disease, and pernicious anemia. Now, that was just the beginning of another very long journey because it just really wasn't known then exactly what to do for Hashimoto's other than prescribe thyroid hormone replacement. So from, from that period of time to now, you know, there have been a lot of changes. Everything that I have gone through, um, past education, education, future, you know, learning that, that I take on, it's all centered on helping women who have Hashimoto's or suspect that they may have Hashimoto's. You went to nine different doctors. Yes. What made you not give up? Because the majority of people will accept the diagnosis after the first thing. What made you keep keep going? I think just my education in the healthcare field in general, I knew that there was something driving the symptoms. So objectively, you could look at my labs and see that, you know, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, um, hypertension, those were not normal for a woman of my age. There was no family history of those conditions. You know, looking at, at my labs and then my subjective symptoms, I just knew that something was driving it. I learned from my grandmother, you know, in the 60s, my grand, one of my grandmothers was the most forward 
thinking women I've ever known. <laughs> and she knew everything about every vitamin, every mineral, everything. And I probably had a PhD in vitamins and minerals by the time I was a teenager, just from her. But she taught me and instilled upon me, you know, if the body is out of balance, you know, certain symptoms are going to manifest. It doesn't just go awry, and it's not all just genetics, and there's always something, and you have to get to the root of what's going on. And so I just continued to be driven and had faith that, you know, I would get some answers, and I did. Um, unfortunately, you know, it was a decade of my life full of learning <laughs> and feeling hopeful going to a doctor that you know this will be the time I finally get answers did your emotions come into play at any time in this because it seems like to me that you were on a roller coaster like you would have some go to see one doctor you'd get some hope and then you'd kind of go back down into the cavern a little bit and you'd go see another doctor and for a regular person if you go through that process eight or nine doctors to me, I'm going to hold some type of animosity against some of those doctors, especially this world-renowned endocrinologist. Did your emotions come into play in any of this? Absolutely. Um, I really lost hope in the medical system, and I felt like I wasn't being heard. I felt like that they viewed me as a hypochondriac. And at one point, I think one of the doctors had me almost convinced that maybe I was a hypochondriac, <laughs> but, but it wasn't. It's, it's, it's all such a mind game, and it's disappointing. Um, the emotions that came after I finally was diagnosed, you know, you would think that, that I was joyful after being diagnosed, but I was really, <clears throat> it really hardened my heart for a period of time because I was so upset, you know, at those doctors who couldn't or wouldn't help me. You know, and I realized that I had to learn to forgive them, the situation, their lack of knowledge, whatever it was for me to be able to move forward and heal because Hashimoto's is not, it's not even a thyroid disease, really. It's an autoimmune disease, just like lupus, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, or whatever label we put on an autoimmune condition, they're all the same. And emotions are strongly tied to the autoimmune process. Why do you think so many women are suffering from thyroid issues? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Um, you know, there has to be a genetic propensity for an autoimmune condition. It doesn't mean that just because your mother or father or aunt or whomever had a certain autoimmune condition that you will have the same one, but there is a good chance that because it is in the family that the autoimmune process will manifest in you as something else, like another autoimmune condition. And there has to be a trigger. So a trigger could be trauma that may be emotional or physical, like you know, um, some sort of childhood adverse event or surgery or trauma, car accident, something major. So it could be um, a trigger, could be a virus, some type of pathogen. Um, it could be just blatant long-term nutrient deficiencies depending on your body's tolerance for certain things. And so there has, like I said, there has to be genetic propensity, a trigger, and then the third one is intestinal permeability also known as leaky gut mm -hmm. so those three factors pretty much have to be in place for an autoimmune condition to even develop but you know toxins in the environment women are exposed to many more toxins per day than our men <clears throat> household cleaning chemicals beauty and self-care you know cosmetics and such play a role hair coloring you know so it's this continued exposure that many researchers believe is a factor. It's also um, believed by most integrative and functional medicine practitioners that iodine is actually a factor in playing a role in the development of Hashimoto's. Yeah, I want to ask you about that, particularly about uh, iodine and selenium and, mm -hmm. you know, if you use those. But before we get to that, 
I did some research in many, many years ago when I first got into just wanting to know more about nutrition. I bumped up into a couple of different articles and you mentioned things that can be triggers. It seems like an alarming amount of women seem to have these thyroid conditions after the first baby. Yes. Is that because of all the hormonal changes that are going on? Well, it is related. The hormones and the nervous system are closely related and then they have an influence on our immune system. So during pregnancy, a woman's immune system becomes hyperactive and that's normal because she's carrying a baby. But in some women, depending on, you know, if these other three factors um, come into play, Many, many women develop Hashimoto's after their pregnancy, after delivery. Yeah, that's what I, I mean. When I did the research, I, I, I kind of ran into that where women were getting this autoimmune disease right after their pregnancy. Let's mm -hmm. distinguish what is the difference between an autoimmune condition like Hashimoto's versus maybe a just diagnosis of hypothyroidism. What's so different about those two diagnoses? Sure. So in basic hypothyroidism, the immune system is not the problem. So for some reason, a person starts to experience low thyroid function. That could be related to an adrenal fatigue problem where the thyroid is responding to um, suboptimal adrenal gland hormones or the adrenal glands under stress. But in, in an autoimmune condition, the immune system is confused and it's chaotic and it actually loses self-tolerance. So the immune system can no longer <clears throat> recognize which cells are self, you know, like which cells belong to you and which cells are a pathogen like a virus or a bacteria that need to be destroyed. So... In autoimmune thyroid disease, the target is the thyroid gland. And you have these um, immune system cells, TPO antibodies or thyroglobulin antibodies, that are attacking the thyroid. Um, there's an interesting quote that my friend, um, oh, I can't think of her name, <laughs> uh, but awesome. she... <laughs> she actually says, if your body is at war with yourself, where are you at war in your life? Which I think is pretty interesting because the autoimmune process is a war going on in your, in your body. Stacy Robbins, that's her quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know yeah. when you get on the air, it just seems like you forget everything. I know. I know. I know. That, <laughs> that was a okay. brain fog moment. <laughs> yeah, brain fog. <laughs> When you, but, you talk, you talked a little bit about adrenals. Go ahead and finish your thought, and then I'll ask you. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you know, I mentioned earlier that I don't consider Hashimoto's a quote unquote thyroid disease because it's not the thyroid that's the problem. It does become a problem because it does uh, lead to hypothyroidism, but it's not a a dysfunction of the thyroid gland at all. It's the immune system. So. I get really frustrated with mainstream medicine because, for example, in any other autoimmune condition, and I mentioned lupus, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, and there are upwards of 100 um, autoimmune conditions. But when those diagnoses are made, the mainstream medicine model approach is to shut the immune system down by steroids or whatever. When a diagnosis of Hashimoto's is made, um, the approach is to just give replacement thyroid hormone, but then they don't view shutting the immune system down in any way as necessary. Now, I don't think it's necessary either. I just want to point out that if that approach, you know, holds water, then why are we allowing a chaotic immune system to sort of run crazy in Hashimoto's when... Hashimoto's is definitely a precursor to cancer, and thyroid cancer is one of the fastest growing cancers among women in the U.S. right now. So, um, you know, it, it's, there's no logic there. But then again, we have to consider that there's really no medical specialty in the United States for autoimmune conditions. 
I wanted to ask you, you, you said something about adrenals and you touched on that a little bit. How much is, are the adrenals in play when it comes to uh, Hashimoto's? Extremely, because Hashimoto's creates this 24-7 um, inflammatory process in the body. And that that is stressful to the adrenals. So, you know, they're trying to release cortisol to cope with the stress. And then as this continues over time, they can no longer keep up with the stress and you slip into adrenal fatigue, which the medical term is hypoadrenia. Um, and there are three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three, that most of us with autoimmune conditions float in and out of all the phases. I've never really seen anyone who has Hashimoto's completely heal their adrenals, but they do get, they can get better. It's just that they're part of the, you know, the hypopituitary axis there. And if the adrenal glands are struggling and deplete of their hormones, what happens is if, if they can't make cortisol efficiently, the body will steal progesterone to make cortisol and that affects the thyroid gland because they're you know the thyroid gland has receptors for progesterone and it's just a vicious cycle so if they're once it reaches the hypothyroidism phase um, if the thyroid gland is off the adrenal glands are off and the sex hormones are off because it's a three-legged stool so if one organ system is out of balance they all are so you can't just approach one specific area without the other yeah so you're tired you don't want to have sex you probably don't want to be bothered with anybody at that point in time exactly it's just you know in the way that it's also the physical appearance you know that a woman goes through who is experiencing these issues and it's when you, when you're not getting enough t3 to the cells you you have a lot of cellular waste where the cells can't detoxify. And the way that appears is, you know, the puffiness in the face, around the eyes, the hands and feet. It's very uncomfortable. You have the dry, scaly skin. You um, often experience <clears throat> experience hair loss. And it's, it's just an extremely difficult time for, for a woman inside and out. You mentioned that the immune system is kind of on alert. The immune system is on overdrive. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of women who run around like maybe they're crazy. How much does, how much involves where it's just a matter of relaxing? Because we, we tend to live in a society right now where we don't seem to relax and then women take that to the third power because they're trying to take care of everybody around them. How much do you work with people in work with a woman just getting her to kind of relax and let the body uh, begin to heal itself? Oh, it's a lot of my practice. As a matter of fact, my principles of Hashimoto's health program, which is a 12 week program, you know, for the first four modules, that's all we focus on. The women are so excited to come to me and, and think we're going to address all the supplements and, the, you know, the prescription medications and all those things. But those are the last things we look at. We have to get our, our mind, our emotions, and our heart right to be able to heal. Like, you can't just take medication and supplements and heal your body if, if your mind, you know, if you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself, if you don't love yourself, if you're responding to the pressures of society and saying yes to everything and everyone. What I think women don't understand is though, you know, we're very intelligent and we can do anything we want. But when you look at a woman's hormone system in comparison to a man's, we are a much we have a much more delicately designed system. And it doesn't take much to throw it off. And so when we try to do everything and be everything and serve everyone and everything, you know, we're usually the ones who, who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. And our immune system is extremely vulnerable because negative thoughts, pressures we put on ourselves, these are all contributing to inflammation in the body. You talked about at the beginning, we were. You mentioned Synthroid. You were on Synthroid. 
it's Synthroid. I can't remember the, the other one. I, I'm getting a brain fog too here on air, but uh, <laughs> Synthroid is a, a, a pretty much maybe a couple of them out there, these synthetic uh, thyroid hormones. How effective are these when it comes to treating either just a simple thyroid condition and then something as complex as, as Hashimoto's? Well, first of all, <clears throat> Synthroid is T4 only, so it has no T3 in it, and it's useless to the body because it has to be converted. So the success of Synthroid or any T4 only medication is contingent upon your body's ability to convert it. Most Hashimoto's patients cannot convert it very well because I mentioned earlier we have gut issues, leaky gut syndrome and all kinds of things. There could be GI pathogens which are common. So, you know, your body's just not going to convert that medication very well. The only patients really I've ever seen who are good converters of Synthroid are people who perhaps have had thyroid cancer, unfortunately, and they don't have a thyroid at all. Um, it was removed and you know, why they can be successful with Synthroid, I'm not sure, but I just don't see it very often. Um, the liver plays a huge role in the conversion of thyroid hormone. Um, many patients with autoimmune conditions have underlying candida in the GI tract, and that suppresses the conversion of thyroid hormone. So there are many factors why that's not necessarily the most appropriate medication. Now, I will say that many women with Hashimoto's, when they're initially prescribed Synthroid, they notice sort of a subjective improvement in their symptoms, but it doesn't seem to be long-lasting. And this just points to, you know, their body's inability to, to convert it well. Um, levothyroxine is the generic for Synthroid. So it yeah, would be the same there. <laughs> couldn't remember that one. I don't know why. <laughs> I couldn't remember that one. You said something about liver. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have never done any type of detoxification. How important is detoxification, especially when you're dealing with the thyroid? Extremely. As a matter of fact, I just wrapped up my fall um, Hashi Sisters thyroid jump start because I'm a strong believer in seasonal detox programs for women with Hashimoto's. However, they they do need to be supervised. They do need to be, you know, put forward and sort of moderated by someone who knows what they're doing because a lot of these cleanses are very aggressive um, fasting and crazy, doing crazy things that, you know, can also stress the adrenals. So, they need to be done safely and in accordance with the seasons. For women with Hashimoto's, um, the fall season is a particularly wonderful season to detox because the produce that's harvested this time of year, all the squashes and so forth, actually help to plump up the villi in the small intestines, which means we absorb our nutrients better which is that exactly what we need as we're going into the winter months when typically, you know, our vitamin D drops, we don't metabolize thyroid hormone as efficiently <clears throat> in colder months as we do in summer months when it's warmer. So th that's really helpful. And just that reset to help the liver function better, um, to convert our hormone and maximize nutrient absorption. What about, do probiotics come into play anywhere in there? They do. And there's um, some controversy coming out about how long we need to be on probiotics. Um, many researchers are saying, and at the last conference I attended, they're saying that whether it's an autoimmune condition or not, if you have corrected your diet, you know, um, and you've established or reestablished your gut flora with good bacteria, after some period of time, and it can be different for different people, you have to look at the continual chronic use of probiotics may not be the best way to go. Because, you know, the, the, the thinking is you want the probiotics to take root and colonize and thrive in your GI tract 
just because you miss your dose of probiotics for a week doesn't mean the, <laughs> the probiotics, the flora you've reestablished, are falling out of your body. And so um, some believe that this is actually contributing to a condition called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh -huh. So this reliance on the chronic use of probiotics is really under scrutiny right now. Having said that, if a person's diet is not good and they're exposed to a lot of stress and they're, you know, they're overworked and just in general ill health, I don't think they're harmful. I'm not saying that, but we really have to question why we would use them every day long term. Talking about diet, because diet seems to be of utmost importance right now. What's an ideal diet for someone who is recovering or trying to put a condition like Hashimoto's into remission? Yes, yeah, so in my Hashi Sisters Thyroid E course, which is free, um, it's on my website, I think like the first three modules are focused solely on inflammation. Inflammation is the root of our symptoms, and, and it's the root of being able to get a handle on reversing the symptoms of Hashimoto's. And diet comes into play very strongly here. So I am a huge proponent of food sensitivity testing, you know, because what, one, what, what is considered one healthy food for one person for whatever reason, for the next person, it's causing inflammation in the immune system. So an anti-inflammatory diet that's focused solely on your food sensitivity issues in conjunction with eliminating the foods that we know play a role in molecular mimicry, like gluten, soy, uh, GMO corn, and dairy. So eliminating those, whether a food sensitivity shows you're sensitive or not, is a very important measure to take. Um, and then just basically, you know, eliminating your unique food sensitivities. That will help. We've seen so much progress, and I've even seen patients be able to get into remission, you know, when they were diagnosed early, and embrace the concept of really wrapping their mind around this and and complying with a protocol to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. Yeah, I've had where um, I've had someone on their food sensitivity, uh, talking about food sensitivity testing. I myself worked in a food sensitivity lab and I was amazed at how many tests came back with people who didn't think they were sensitive to any foods. And I've seen tests where they've come back with 20, 21 sensitivities. I myself had 22 sensitivities. Well. So, <laughs> and I managed to pull them out of my diet, but I never felt better after doing that. And then now if something, I encounter something in my immune system that isn't quite right, my immune system is at that height where I recognize it immediately. But before my immune system was so bogged down, I didn't mm -hmm. know, you know, like I was sensitive to pepper. Who would have thought pepper? Because you season <laughs> meat, you see, and you put everything pretty much has pepper in it. But I'm highly sensitive to pepper. Well, with um, the did you want to say something? No, I just wanted to say that. So, women go in and they they have their thyroid labs done, and they can see like if TPO antibodies are a factor for them. What my point is here is that's a that is an immune system cell, and we can't feel what our immune system cells are doing. So people always think that if they're sensitive to a food, you know, that they would feel it digestively, like they would have some kind of sy symptom in their stomach or whatever. Yeah. What, I'm, what, I, what my point is here is that you can't feel what your white blood cells are doing to, you know, in response to foods that are causing inflammation. A food sensitivity, when you break it down, means that a certain food is causing the white blood cells to change shape or even rupture. That's what it technically is. And you can't necessarily feel that. But reducing that inflammatory process will help the autoimmune thyroid process in general. Yeah. Plus, it'll help you lose weight. 
Yeah, I had a woman when I used to work at the food sensitivity lab, an ND uh, naturopath, that she swore by the sensitivity testing, pulling the foods out, that it had helped with the patient's uh, markers, yes. their, uh, autoimmune markers. So I can definitely agree with that. Are there any telltale signs or symptoms to distinguish between maybe a regular hypothyroidism and a Hashimoto's? Not really. Um, when it gets to the point that it's that you're experiencing the classic hypothyroidism symptoms, like foggy brain and you know fatigue and weight gain for no reason, puffiness, um, joint pain, muscle pain. By the time you're experiencing those symptoms, the autoimmune process is well underway. <clears throat> you may not have been tested correctly. You may have only had your TSH tested and it showed the hypothyroidism has already, you know, occurred. But if you haven't been tested correctly for the autoimmune side of the process, you may not be aware. Take us through a test because I know that a lot of people, I've spoken to people and they and I'll ask them, I said, have you ever had your hypo, your, your thyroid tested? And they'll say, yeah. And immediately after that, they'll say the doctor told me it was normal. So if I'm going in to the doctor and mm -hmm. I'm going to get tested, what test do I need to ask for? Okay. Specifically, we need to request free T3. If it doesn't say the word free in front of it, it's not free. It's bound. So we want to know what's free and available to the cells. So free T3 free T4, reverse T3. We want to be tested for TPO antibodies, which is thyroperoxidase antibodies. We want to be tested for thyroglobulin antibodies. We do want to request the TSH test, but never, you know, alone or with only the T4 test because it's just a one part of the picture. We want to look at sex hormone binding globulin, that, sh that marker will show how much T3 is actually being carried around and into the cells. And we also want to be tested for um, vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 plays a strong role in thyroid health in that, you know, it's not even actually a, a vitamin. Vitamin D is a hormone <laughs> in the way that it works in the body. And where thyroid... Um, health is concerned, it's vitamin D that actually makes the receptors on the cells so that T3 can even get inside the cell. So this is one reason why in colder months when vi vitamin D drops, you know, and our thyroid levels drop, it's because we don't have the, receptor, the receptors on our cells, but our vitamin D is low. Um, the optimal range for vitamin D um, most functional and integrative practitioners are looking at for Hashimoto's concerns is anywhere from 70 to 90. And the labs that I see, uh, women are severely deficient for the most part and are just unaware, you know, of what their levels should be. So those are the, the, the main markers to request. And I would also say that always insist upon a copy of your own labs. Keep a notebook and keep all of your labs over time because, you know, no one is going to care more about a woman's health than she does, except maybe her mother, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, and this is how you pick up subtle changes over time. So, you, you know, you want to look at some early labs and look at baselines and you want to, you know, even mark on your labs if you're on thyroid medication what does that thyroid lab, what is that reflecting? What is the dose of your thyroid medication? Maybe even know how you felt, you know, how you're feeling. Are you feeling optimal? Or are you not feeling so well? And just keep this over time because it, it tells a story, you know. And as you go through this journey, if it is Hashimoto's, you know, Hashi's is a, it has a relapse and remitting pattern, just like any other autoimmune condition. So it's really important to stay on top of your labs. Don't accept, oh, your labs are in range, everything looks good, because when it comes to thyroid levels, 
there's a strong difference between normal and optimal, and we want to be optimal in our levels. There seems to be two camps when it comes to Hashimoto's. One camp says supplement with iodine, and then there's another camp that says if you're using iodine, then you have to use selenium along with it. What's been your experience with, with those two things? Um, disaster. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I asked. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of confusion, you know, where iodine is concerned. Uh, and it can, it's often a heated debate on Facebook. I see in some of the forums, it's like if you're not supplementing with iodine, you just, you know, you're crazy or something. Um, I understand the science behind iodine. Uh, you know, the thyroid does use iodine to make thyroid hormone. We all know this. But the truth is most of us are not deficient in iodine. And we actually consume a lot of foods that contain iodine. And I, I've shared with my following, you know, the, the iodine content in a variety of foods. <clears throat> the sad part about iodine testing is that there's not really an accurate test for iodine. The closest measure we have is a urine test, but that's not even foolproof. Um, and you typically have to take a 50 milligram tablet of iodorel or something before you know, the test is done. Um, what I have seen, Darren, personally and with countless patients, regardless of being on selenium and vitamin C, you know, all of the cofactors they say are required for iodine. What I have seen is that it's like pouring gas on a fire. It excites TSH, it excites TPO antibodies, and it brings on with a vengeance, hypothyroid symptoms. There's great controversy and misunderstanding, but you know when you look at the work, for example, of Dr. Ellen Christensen, who has put forward that iodine is actually a toxin uh, in terms of how it relates to Hashimoto's, it's not something we need to supplement with. It's okay if it's in a <clears throat> For example, a multivitamin, because it's going to be in a ratio that we would find in food if it's in a multivitamin. Or even consuming foods that contain it in moderation. But to go out and supplement like with a 50 milligram tablet or whatever, it's just, I have not found it to be helpful personally or with, with any patient I've ever worked with. When it comes to using what we would consider holistic or natural supplements, you have things out there like, uh, and don't quote me on this, it's been a while since I've heard it, uh, Armour Thyroid, Nature Thyroid, things of that nature. Yes. And these things, if, if they have fillers in them, can they affect the, the thyroid? Because I know there was a big controversy maybe three or four years ago that someone was using gluten in their uh, holistic supplement and I'm wondering if there's a filler in there like maltodextrin is that going to affect the thyroid oh absolutely so you know natural desic what these medications are is natural desiccated thyroid hormone that comes from a pig from the pig thyroid hormone so it, they will have t1 t2 t3 and t4 in the same ratios as what the human thyroid uh, also makes they've been around since the 1950s they do have research to back them up even though big pharmacists they don't <laughs> um, I think Synthroid came about in the 70s don't quote me on that but natural desiccated thyroid has been around forever and armor is one of the first well something happened in the years 2008 and 2009 so in 2008 um, Armour Thyroid, it was rumored that they were forced to change their formulary. And what they did was they raised the level of cellulose and reduced the level of dextrose. Many women um, reported a return of hypothyroid symptoms coming back with a vengeance. And it was because they weren't absorbing the medication. Cellulose binds thyroid hormone and carries it on out to the toilet, so to speak. 
So that happened in 2008 with Armour. It happened again with Nature Freud in 2009. What was so interesting is that these companies sort of went underground. They didn't make any public statements that this had even occurred. So it was all there was a you know huge cloud of mystery around what happened and why because after all of these years, these were great medications that were really helping women, you know, to feel better and improve their symptoms. Um, since then, we have. NP thyroid, which is my favorite, it's produced by Acela Pharmaceuticals, and then there's also Westroy P. But it has been rumored, I know that Westroy P contains lactose, and that's a problem. Um, it also, I believe, contains chicory root as a filler, which can be a problem because it functions much in the same way as does cellulose. Armor and Westroy P with the rays, or Nature Throid, excuse me, with the rays of the level of cellulose still carry um, absorption problems, absorption issues for women. Um, the thyroid community at large has learned that using your natural desiccated thyroid medication sublingually gives optimal results. So. For example, for women with Hashimoto's, when you can bypass the GI tract, you know, where those immune system cells are already primed to attack thyroperoxidase and thyroglobulin, which is a part of the, the pig thyroid hormone. So as those molecules break apart and the immune system attacks those cells, by, you know, because you've swallowed the pill, by allowing it to dissolve under your tongue, you can sort of bypass that process. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I got a question for you, and it's kind of one of those the questions where which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does the thyroid influence hormones, or do the hormones influence the thyroid? Both. Both. <laughs> both. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> they both do because it's that three-legged stool again. Mm -hmm. If if you have Hashimoto's and the thyroid is under attack and it's not able to produce its hormones optimally that is going to affect the sex hormones, you know, and that's also going to affect the adrenals. If it begin, if hormone imbalance starts first, you know, and Hashimoto's is not an issue, it's still going to affect the thyroid and the adrenals. And this is often a period of time when a woman will find out she has Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism is when she starts to go through menopause because the, the hormones are declining and, you know, that's when all the symptoms show up. And uh, that's often when a condition, you know, related to the thyroid is discovered. I wanted to ask you about this and then I have one more question. We'll wrap up. I don't want to take all of your night here, but... This seems to be a hot topic, and I've been seeing this a lot. I have several friends on Facebook, and this seems to be popping up a lot, especially when it comes in conjunction with thyroid issues. It just seems like they're one and the same. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about Epstein-Barr virus, because this has been, it keeps popping up for me. So <laughs> I'm like, I know I have to ask her this question when, when I do get her on for the interview, but... Is there a correlation there with Epstein-Barr virus and, and thyroid issues? Oh, absolutely. And I'm so glad you asked because I just posted one of my articles from June on the Holistic Thyroid Care Facebook page today about the three stealth infections um, that are so common in Hashimoto's. So Epstein-Barr, EBV, is one of those um, underlying stealth infections that can be a problem that... You know, you can actually have a reactivated case of Epstein-Barr. And um, this happened to my husband a couple of years ago. So I kind of thought it might have been Epstein-Barr, you know, based on his symptoms. His homocysteine level and C-reactive protein levels were just extremely, extremely high. So I knew, you know, there's inflammation, there's something going on here. So we tested for EBV. We go to the doctor, share the results. I can clearly see that he has an active case of EBV, but because doctors are trained, you know, to quickly look at IgG antibody activity, um, 
you know, they said, no, he doesn't have it. It's a dormant. It's dormant. Well, we have IgG antibodies. You know, if you had mono as a child, you'll have those IgG antibodies most of your life. But if you look and test for the active early antigen, not everybody tests for that. You've got to ask for active early IgG antigen against EBV. And if that, if that level is greater than 11, it means that it's an active infection and it has to be treated. So we've, I don't know if you're familiar with low-dose naltrexone, LDN. Yes. Yes, okay, I, so, have, I interviewed the woman who, uh, Linda Elsie Good. Yes. <laughs> so I interviewed her, and I'm <laughs> going to put that interview up actually within the next couple of days. So, yeah, good, I'm, I'm very good. familiar with it, yes. Well, I'm also a volunteer nurse educator for LDN, <laughs> for the LDN Research Trust. Great. But it, it ha many women have been able to get into remission with LDN. We've seen many women fall out of remission due to an activated Epstein-Barr virus case. So, you know, we would come off the LDN, treat the EBV, and then they could go back on LDN. But it is a one of those stealth infections that kind of lays low and can reactivate. We talked about this off the air, and I, I said I had one more question, but I, I'm going to actually have two more. <laughs> um, subclinical, when you di you're diagnosed, because someone's close to me has been diagnosed with subclinical hypothyroidism, and you had an, something interesting to say about that. So uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so you have to consider what's going on in the body that, you know, the thyroid just <laughs> doesn't work as well as it used to. It's not necessarily a normal part of aging. So this is probably going to confuse a lot of people, and I hope it doesn't, but just because TPO antibodies are not showing up yet on a blood test doesn't mean that you don't have Hashimoto's because it can take many, many years for those little warriors <laughs> fighting against your thyroid to actually show up on a blood test. So what I say is maybe consider caring for yourself and treating, being treated as though it is Hashimoto's because Hashimoto's does cause more than 90% of cases of hypothyroidism. You know, so you want to look at your, we mentioned diet and um, the health of the gut. We want to look at the adrenal glands. We want to look at food sensitivities, nutrient deficiencies, any underlying co-infections, you know, because, like I said, when I heard this news, and it was last year at a thyroid conference, I was with Dr. Isabella Wentz and Dr. Karazian and others, mm -hmm. and when they lectured on, you know, just because you don't have antibodies against the thyroid doesn't mean you don't have Hashimoto's. It just speaks to the power and the mystery of the immune system, honestly. Yeah, I would agree with you because, I, I mean... Like I said before, earlier in the interview where I was testing, I never thought that I was sensitive to anything, any foods, but I realize now how active my immune system was fighting those things I was eating every day, pretty much day in and day out and really didn't even know it. And I really noticed the, dis the, the difference when I pulled those things out of my diet, how my immune system calmed down and seemed to have a much more heightened response to certain things that I ate after that. So yes, really good. The last question is um, just some insight. You've been on your journey and this has been a journey for you. I'm wondering you and you see people, women day in and day out. How much was this a strain on your personal relationships and how have things, how were things improved when you finally got out of this fog, so to speak? Yeah, so that's a great question because it did affect my relationships. You know, during those eight years that I was really suffering and had that bone crushing fatigue, there was usually only one day a week that I actually got out of the house. You know, actually got up, put my makeup on, got out of the house, and a lot of times that was just on Sunday. So friends and whatnot would see me at church and they would hear that I don't feel well, but you know, they're it's an invisible disease like no one can see anything's wrong with you and then your family around you they don't understand it they see you go into all these doctors 
and you have all these symptoms, but nobody's finding anything. <laughs> and so they even they start to think, hmm, you know, what is this? And it's it's very difficult because I felt like I felt personally like I had to explain myself all the time, you know. Uh-huh. And I would get that feeling from people that they they feel like, you know, why don't you just give up? The doctors aren't finding anything, so obviously there's nothing wrong. <laughs> And so it was It was very, I said earlier, isolating and fearful and just feeling like, you know, is this, is it ever going to get any better? You know, I couldn't imagine, Darren, back then that, you know, I would move forward in the, the many decades I had left on this earth feeling like I did in my body at that time. I just didn't have any hope to to, you know, I thought if this is how I'm going to age, (laughs) I don't know if I want to continue feeling, you know, if it, if it gets any worse, I don't know. So it did affect relationships. And finally, you know, you just don't want to be around people when they don't understand what you're going through. You know, when you feel like they're judging you, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. I would imagine there's a lot of guilt behind that too, just simply because you, Mm -hmm. you feel bad, but then again, you really don't want to be around people because you know that you've got this condition. And like you said, you know, you're pretty much blaming yourself and mm-hmm. you think that others are viewing you like you're crazy. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. You do. And you feel guilt and you feel like you have to apologize. Um, I remember the day I came home and shared with my husband what my diagnosis was. <laughs> Not only did I get one autoimmune condition, I got three. Um that day and he I said it's Hashimoto's and he's like Hashi who you know it, it's like what in the world is bad mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what do we do what do, what do you take to fix it you know that's that's what my family had to say what do you take to fix it and yeah Shannon Garrett this has been a great interview I'm so glad that we got a chance to reschedule this and finally get you on and for those people who are out there who might be maybe looking to work with you or want to find out more about you what is your website okay so they can go to holisticthyroidcare.net and I'm on Facebook at Holistic Thyroid Care you can find me either place would love to connect I've got you know an awesome um Hashi Sisters Autoimmune Thyroid Solutions Group. We'd love to have them there to connect with other women, connect with other Hashi Sisters. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. like I said, Shannon, thank you so much for being on and I uh, really enjoyed the interview. Thank you, Darren. Pleasure to be here. Want entertainment designed just for you? Then check out customizable streaming TV from Xfinity. It makes your life simple, easy, awesome. Xfinity gives you customizable streaming TV options. Enjoy the most free shows anywhere on any device and even access your streaming apps right on your TV with X1. Go to Xfinity.com, call 1-800-XFINITY, or visit a store today to learn more. Restrictions apply.